I'm going to begin a series of videos on the King Jesus version. Uh, more commonly called the King James version, the authorized version. But uh, if you get right down to it, this book is about one man, and that man is Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm going to be showing you some really interesting things in this series of videos, things that the Lord has shown me. And um, if you're saved, it's going to be an incredible blessing and encouragement. If you're lost, then you're going to call me a cult leader and say, I haven't proved my point and whatever. <laughs> um, so I'm not really worried about what lost people think of me, never have been. But uh, let's go to our King James Bibles and open up to John chapter 1. We're going to start out this series of sermons with talking about the Word and the Light of the King Jesus Version. Um, it's going to be a rather interesting study. John chapter 1. And this is one of those studies that I don't want you just to listen to it and whatever else. You need to actually go to the scriptures in your King James Version. King Jesus Version is what I'll be calling it for the purpose of the study. I'm not trying to rename it or anything else, but please understand where I'm going with this study. But I'd like you to actually look at what you're reading and see the importance of the words of this blessed book right here. This is no ordinary book. If you've been reading the King James Bible for a long time, you know that this is no ordinary book. This wasn't just written by men and it has translation errors or no, I don't think so. John chapter 1, we'll read down to verse, start in verse 1, read down to verse 14 to get into proper context here. In the beginning was the Word, the manifest Word there, capital W, that's how you know it's the manifest Word, referring to Jesus Christ, one of his titles. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Remember that, that will be important later. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness uh, of the light that all men through him might believe. Now you see a capital L there, capital L light, another title. Verse 8, he was not that light, you see it again, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus came to the Jewish people, and they didn't receive him as their Messiah. Verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the, of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Speaking about Jesus Christ. But you see two different titles in these 14 verses here. You see the word, capital W, that's a name, in other words, and you see the light, capital L. Hmm. What's the relationship between the word and the light? That's what the study is going to be about. So, but I want to point out a couple things here. First and foremost, the world was made by Jesus. Turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. It's very important to get. Jesus is not a created being. Um, if you ultimately get to the Trinitarian system, um, they teach you have to eventually get back to the thing that Jesus would have been created at some point in time. A son is always created, a, unless he somehow is eternally there or something, the eternal son of God, which I know that some teach that. And Trinitarianism is not just a cut and dry, this is the way it is. There's differences in, in things with some of the different Trinitarians. Um, it's not as settled as they'd like you to believe, in other words. Jesus was not created. It's as simple as that. All things were made by him. It's an important thing. I cover that really well in my book on the Godhead Doctrine. If you want to get a copy of that, uh, it gets into the arguments and whatever else. I'm not trying to sell a book or whatever here. I'm just simply saying there's a lot of arguments, a lot of scripture 
that you get into and you have to compare scripture with scripture. You can't just go and say, oh, give it to me in five minutes or less. No, it requires a lot of study. And that's why it's better sometimes to read a book to explain some things in here. Um, but Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12 and reading down through verse 17. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So we have it switching from Father to Son in context. Verse 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus is the, in, the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the body. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. That's how the Godhead works out in the Bible. If you believe in the Trinity, that's wrong. If you believe in modalism, that's wrong. The biblical Godhead is Jesus Christ is the physical appearance, the body, the flesh. God the Father is the soul and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. I'll be saying that throughout this study. But look at this. As we're still in context. We're still talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 16 for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Stop there for just a minute. You say, well, how could that be talking about Jesus? Because that would mean then that Jesus had to create the Father. No, it's talking about this being, Jesus being the outward, the image of the invisible God. It's talking about one being there. They were all there at the beginning. There isn't some kind of a weird thing of the Father was there and then He created the Son, or, and then the love between them created the Holy Spirit, or whatever. That's not a teaching that you can find in Scripture. It's just simply not there. All three parts of the Godhead were there in the beginning. They created everything. And you say, well, explain it to me. It doesn't make sense, though, that saying that all things were created by Him, by the Son. Okay. Some man says, I made this painting, this beautiful, you know, artistic painting. I put my heart and soul into this. Well, then was it his soul that painted that painting? Or was it his body of flesh? It was his body of flesh. You see? So the soul can create, but it takes a body of flesh to be able to make that happen. That's what, how it works out. God the Father created all things by Jesus Christ. My soul, if I do some kind of artwork, my soul creates through my flesh. You see? There have been many a times when I used to be in artistic wood turning where my flesh was really tired and really sore, but I was really into making a piece and getting it done, and I just kept going. And I had that, you know, second wind, what they might call it, you know, kind of interesting, sort of a, a you know, spirit. But uh, I, I had that inspiration. And so I was able, able to overcome the weakness of my flesh. Okay. But let's get back to the passage here. Um, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Um, so it's very important there to understand that Jesus Christ is the creator. Um, and the Father being the soul is inside of him. They're not two separate persons. And then the Holy Spirit's a third person. That's not in scripture. You will never find that teaching. Very important to understand that. But uh, let's make another point here. Um, Genesis chapter 1. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Our passage there in John chapter 1 said that Jesus is the light. Hmm. The Word. Jesus the Word is also the light. Let's look about that. Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 through 5. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Huh. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Very interesting there. God separated the light from the darkness. You know, we're going to be getting into some more scriptures on this here as we continue. But um, 
this book here will separate you from the darkness of sin. God will bring light into your life and he'll convict you of certain things and say, hey, don't mess with that anymore. The nightlife that you used to go out and be part of when you were lost, no, that's not for you anymore. We're of the day now. We're not of the night nor of darkness. We'll talk more about that later as we continue as well. But go to, back to John chapter 1. God created the light and separated it from the darkness. Hmm. Back to your New Testament, John chapter 1. And you will see the significance as we go through this study. You will see it's not just a few verses to tie in. It's a multitude of verses. John chapter 1 verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus Christ, when he came to the earth, he was the word of God manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. There are people that say there's no clear teaching that Jesus is God. Oh, there's plenty of teaching that Jesus is God, but you have to be saved to understand it. See, that's the difference there. A lot of people, they don't, they don't believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. They, don't, they haven't put their faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. And the Holy Spirit has never been you know, moved inside of them. So they're dead in trespasses and sins. They're in their own self-righteousness. They've had a false conversion, essentially. And that's why they don't understand. They don't see that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. They're in darkness. The light of God's word hasn't shined un unto them. Okay, Psalm 43. Now we're going to start getting into some other scriptures that make tie-ins between the light and the word. Psalm 43. And believe me, when I get done with this series of, of videos, you are going to have a whole new respect for this authorized version, King Jesus version here. Um, absolutely incredible, the stuff that the Lord has showed me in this study. It's going to be a real good blessing to you. Psalm 43, verse 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Very interesting there. Thy light and thy truth. Sanctify them through thy, tr thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17 talks about that. Uh, just an amazing thing there. Again, you see a tie-in between uh, the word and light. Psalm 119 Go to Psalm 119. A lot of people, they say, well, you're in, involved in bibliolatry or something like this, and you shouldn't you know, hold the Bible in such a high regard. Um, then you don't understand Jesus Christ. I mean, you have a book that, that tells you all about Jesus Christ, reveals him to you, brings light into your life, and life ultimately comes from this book, uh, Eternal Life. And yet, it's not important. A lot of lost people out there. Uh, I can judge somebody very quickly whether they're saved or not, uh, according to what they say about this book. If somebody doesn't esteem this book and put it in its correct place, um, they're not saved. Very easy. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Um, what is the future without this book? We would have no idea. What happens after you die if you don't have this book? No idea. How was the world created without the Bible in your life? How are we supposed to live? What, why is there so much evil and sin and wickedness and everything else out there? I don't understand. You realize how much you'd be in the dark if you didn't have this Bible? And yet it's not that important. It's very important. 
God's word is supposed to be a light onto your path. It's supposed to bring you into truth. And if you don't believe that, it's because you're lost. Psalm 119, verse 130. And I can say that without any worries at all. Oh, I might have judged the wrong person or something else. It's always boggled my mind. Somebody can come along and say, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but I have no concern at all about this King James Bible right here. I could care less. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Hmm. It giveth understanding unto the simple. God's word brings light into your life so that you're not stumbling around out there with other people that are lost. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 through 26. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Now how about that? I want to make sure where I was reading to here in my notes. How about that? Um, keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Jesus Christ has a bride, the church. But uh, Satan has a bride as well, the Roman Catholic Church. And she comes along and she says... Um, Actually, a better translation would be, the Greek word here would be better said this way or that way. Uh, the King James translators didn't rely on the oldest and best manuscripts. The, and they go on, and they come out with all their new versions, all the Vatican versions there. And um, it's funny because uh, they'll say, I'll get back to this in a minute, verse 26, For by means of a whorish woman, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Revelation 17, clearly the Vatican, a man is brought to a piece of bread. The word of God is also likened to bread. Um, very interesting because what does the Catholic Church try to do to overthrow this King James Bible? They'll talk about this papyrus fragment or this papyrus fragment here or that, you know, we have Vaticanus, we have Sinaiticus, we have all these different little fragments of Scripture. Almost like a piece of bread. They'll overthrow the authority, the weight of all the scriptures because we found one manuscript that differs with it or something else. The vast majority of manuscripts, extant Greek manuscripts, those that are found, that have been, those that have been collated and looked at and everything else, they're in some museum someplace or wherever else, the vast majority of the extant Greek manuscripts will line up with this King James Bible and Hebrew manuscripts as well. The vast majority. But we found some little piece of bread little piece of a, a manuscript or something like this, just a little fragment, and we can overthrow the King James Bible because of it. Isn't that weird? Hmm. And so you get a lot of these guys, and they might start out using the King James Bible, but because of some little piece of bread, all of a sudden they listen to the whorish woman and to her scholars, and they come out and they cast out on this book, this blessed book right here, and they say, it's not really God's Word. It's not perfect. We found an older and better reading. And, you know, there's a very easy way to debunk that whole thing and just say, if that little manuscript is so old and so wonderful, well, why didn't it wear out? Why is it that nobody was using it for centuries? You know, the King James Bible was based on, uh, you know, early or late manuscripts. In other words, ones that aren't that old. Uh, yeah, because people used those manuscripts down through the centuries. The fact that the Vatican can supposedly produce manuscripts, and I say supposedly because there's a lot of controversy there, but that they're just forgeries, especially Sinaiticus, but, you know, the Vatican can produce really ancient manuscripts and they're in really good condition. Uh, that proves that the Vatican doesn't read the Bible. People, Vatican officials and things, um, 
they don't read much Bible. And of course, if you just look at their moral convictions and what they've been doing for thousands of years, you would easily be able to prove that one. Um, so, yeah. Proverbs 16 and verse 15. Let's go there. We'll see more about the light and the word, how it lines up together. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 15. In the light of the king's countenance is life. In his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. The light of the king's countenance is life. Huh. Rather interesting there. You say, how so? John chapter 14. Light and life are connected. Did you know that? Without the light of the sun, you wouldn't have life. I'll say that one more time. Without the light of the sun, you wouldn't have life. You say, oh, S-U-N? That's correct. And also S-O-N, capital S-O-N. We would have no life. By him all things consist, the Bible talks about. We have no light without Jesus Christ. We have no life without Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Hmm. Truth and life connected. Rather interesting. Go back to Isaiah chapter 2 in your Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. How can that happen if Jesus isn't physically there? Like the post-millennial and the amillennial system teach. No, Jesus Christ is physically in Jerusalem for the thousand-year reign. Verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Wait a second. I thought it said up here in uh, verse 3, word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 5, let us walk in the light of the Lord. I wonder if there's a tie-in. I think so. This book brings light into your life. You can't walk in this world without this book. You will stumble. You will fall. Somebody rejects this book, they're rejecting Jesus Christ. And I'll prove it. Isaiah 5 Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 through 24. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to drink, to, excuse me, to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteous, righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the, the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Huh. But verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Verse 24, cast away the word or the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. The word and the light are tied together. You cannot separate the two in terms of, oh, there's no connection there. This book gives light. 
And if you reject this book, you're in darkness. Hmm. But I want you to notice another, another interesting thing here. There's a warning. Whenever the Bible says, woe unto you for doing this or that or whatever else, it's a warning. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Let me just grab something here quick. Woe unto them that put light for darkness. This King James Bible is not God's perfect word. It has issues. It has errors, copyist errors and whatever else. And put darkness for light. This is the Holy Bible. This is a better Bible. We've replaced the King James Bible with our new version. Our new version with the satanic trichetra on the front. The witch's symbol of the witchcraft trinity. Or even the, the trinity of the Bible. of the, or the Not the Bible. The trinity of the Bible professing Christians out there. They'll say the, the, you know, the teaching is the Trinity. No such teaching in Scripture. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. And God says, woe unto them. You better not mess with God's book. If you do, it's because you're in darkness. Very simple. Isaiah 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Verse 16 through 20. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living, to the dead, to the law, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word. Look at this. It is because there is no light in them. Remember what we read in John chapter 1? Jesus Christ has two different names in that. The word and the light. Capital W, capital L. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. You don't understand this book. You hate this book. You have a problem with this book. It's because Jesus Christ is not in you. Hmm. You're not one of his. Rather interesting. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, Send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. Huh. What did it say there? The holy one of Israel, his holy one for a flame? And down there in... Uh, Verse, uh, okay, verse 16. Um, okay, verse 17 has both of it. Uh, his holy one for a flame, and shall burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. Um, I mean, right there again, you have it. The Lord is comparing himself, uh, his word, to light and to a flame there. Rather interesting. Let me turn to the next page here on my notes. Isaiah 60, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Hmm. The whole world lieth in darkness. But we have the light. The Jews, when they were following God's word, they had the light. 
And there's, you can do a whole huge study on the thing of the glory of the Lord. It's an amazing study. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, we're going to see more tie-ins to this, the light of the Lord. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. Okay, we read here, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. Hmm. The light dwelleth with him. The source of all light is Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. And his word brings light. You think that there might be a tie-in? Almost like this book is written about Jesus Christ, and this is actually a physical connection to the God of heaven. Maybe, just maybe. And you shouldn't treat this book just like any other book. It's just a book written by, you know, fallible men and everything else. Um, well, it was written by fallible men, but uh, God had a hand in it. This is God's book. And if God wants to use a tree and say, this tree is going to do something for me or whatever else, I can create this tree to make whatever happen. He can do that, and that tree can still get old and die. God could use sinful men to write his word, but his word continues while they die. So don't give me this argument, well, the translators of the King James Bible, I don't care if the Pope translated the King James Bible. I don't care if the Pope got 50 Jesuits together or something and said, let's sit down and translate the King James Bible. God could use anybody to put his word out. The test for Scripture is Scripture. See if it works. See if it lines up. And this book, when you get to studying it, you start to realize the author of this book is not a man. Okay? A mortal man, I'm saying. Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. This is no ordinary book. It's an extraordinary book. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 3, and we'll read in from verse 3 to verse 6. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the, he the heavens, and the earth was full, full of His praise. And His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of His hand, and there was the hiding of His power. Burning him, or excuse me, before him with the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Huh. Rather interesting there. His brightness, verse 4, was as the light. Hmm. Matthew chapter 4 through the New Testament now. And I'm sure if you're saved, the Holy Spirit's in you, you probably have a lot of verses coming to your mind right now of other ones that would tie in and everything else. We'll be getting to those. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Rather interesting there. Verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Huh. Matthew chapter 17. Go to Matthew chapter 17 next. Again, another reference to light. Tying in with Jesus Christ. 
Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Huh. His raiment was white as the light. He shined as the sun. How powerful is our God? And these foolish uh, atheistic people, they come out and they say, well, see, it's just sun worship. That's all that it is. <laughs> uh, lost people don't get it. God hides things from them. They're in darkness. Luke chapter 2. They have no idea about biblical typology or anything else. or rather foolish. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 32. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit in, into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou, thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people, Israel. Aren't you glad that the light of Jesus Christ has shined upon your life if you're saved? Aren't you glad that uh, we have a book right here, a perfect, holy, written book that we can be led into all truth with, um, that our life can be based upon? I am. If you're not glad for that, well, you know, I don't completely agree then you're lost. And on your way to hell, you're still in darkness. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Beginning in verse 16. The infamous John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Real quick question, by the way. How would you know what the name of the only begotten Son of God was if you didn't have this book? Oh, we don't really need a Bible to be able to lead us into all truth and whatever. We can just kind of, you wouldn't know Jesus Christ if it wasn't for this book. You better hold this book in its proper position in your life. Verse 19. You ready? And this is the condemnation that light is coming into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, the only reason to reject this King James Bible here is because your deeds are evil. You don't like it talking about your sin. You don't like the fact that this King James Bible right here is very honest, brutally honest about how wicked man is. You don't like that. That's why lost people, well, I've, I've read parts of the Bible. I, I have never gotten through the whole thing. Yeah, because they can't. They can't do it. They can't handle it. They're too self-righteous. They're too narrow-minded to be able to read through this book and just bow their head in shame and just say, Oh, God, there is none righteous, no, not one. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become filthy. and Everything your word says about man is true, Lord. We're just no good. Oh, they can't think that way. That's why they reject this book. Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, my most important thing that I want out of life is I want to make sure that my works that I do for the Lord after salvation, I'm not saved by works or maintaining salvation by works, no. 
I'm simply saying works that I do that now that I'm saved, I want to work for the Lord, so I have rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But those works that I do, I need to make sure that they are in line with Scripture because I don't want to, um, you know, uh, not be rewarded because I'm not striving lawfully. So um, I read through here and it says, uh, you know, be not conformed to this world. And the modern church people out there, they say, oh no, we have to conform to the world so that we have to look like the world and sing like the world and dress like the world and act like the world and laugh like the world and everything else to win the world. Uh, no. Um, I want to come to the light of the Word of God so that my deeds can be made manifest. I want to look and say, okay, what I'm doing, is this lining up with God's book? God, could you please give me some light on this issue? Some light from your Word? Hmm.